We're going to get this kicked off in just a minute. Um, one thing that we like to do at 350 Vermont is to start a lot of our workshops and presentations with just like getting to know somebody that you don't know in the crowd. So in a minute, I'm going to get ask you to stand up if you're able and, and go introduce yourself to somebody that you haven't met yet. Um, but before that, um, just a quick update on the programming and agenda of today. Um, we are uh, told everybody who RSVP'd, but unfortunately Roger Hill cannot make it today, which is a big bummer. Um, he's dealing with a, a severe illness right now. Um, as many of you know, he, he hasn't been on the airwaves for uh, a month or so. And he was hoping that he'd be able to make it today, but a couple weeks ago he said that um, he, it didn't look like that would be the case. So um, totally understand if if you're feeling like you'd rather do something else with your night, <laughs> um, we'll not be taking that personally. But what we're going to try to do is continue on with what we had planned for the second half of the program, which is really to be talking about the theories of change. So um, we're holding on the science and the most recent like numbers, updates about what's going on with the climate crisis. But we are going to dig in more today about what do we do about that fact? And how do we kind of like handle that emotionally, both as individuals and in community? And um, how do we think strategically about how to move forward and make change? So if that sounds at all interesting, we'd love to have you stay. Um, and we'll be um, together for the next like hour and 10 minutes. And then pizza will be arriving around 7.15, 7.20 and we'll uh, get to hang out and chat um, a little bit after that, so. Um, great, so now that that's out of the way, um, let's do a little meet and greet. So if you would please stand up and um, go introduce yourself to two people who you don't know and just have a quick conversation about how your summer's going. I'll pull you back in in five minutes. That's okay, so say goodbye. Turn to your seats and uh, Fortunately, we'll have the chance to continue talk, talking to each other um, in, in some ways in more depth um, for tonight. So, so today, um, switch the goals of, of the evening in a way, um, but I think that the essence is going to be something that like, Digging, digging down into something that we all, I'm sure, have thought about. Maybe we've talked about it with our, our partners or our friends. I'm sure we've maybe stayed up a little late at night thinking about this stuff. Um, but ultimately, it's like, we're in a lot of deep shit right now. <laughs> and um, we don't really know what to do about it. And in many ways, that's like, that is the collection of the people that make up 350 Vermont, is a, is a bunch of people who don't know the answers, who are trying to figure it out together. Um, and I think that that is probably the same for many, many people all around the state and the country and the world right now. So given that, um, we want to connect with each other on how big the problem can feel um, and also talk a little bit about like, you know, what are some ways that we can work together and maybe try to eke our way out of this in, in some, way, some way or shape or form. Um, and we all, I will also talk a little bit about 350 Vermont specific, like theory of change, what we're doing, what we believe works, that sort of thing. Um, but I want to make sure that this is not just a 350 Vermont show, that we're actually just connecting um, as, a, as a community of people who are showing up today. So, so um, after this like preamble, we're going to um, spend a decent amount of time in breakouts, um, digging into some collective questions together. Um, then we're going to come back into the main group, um, talk about theory of change, what that is as a concept, and then um, at the end, talk a little bit about what we're doing um, at 350 Vermont. So, um, a, a quick note about what this workshop is and what it isn't. Um, I think I talked about this a little bit. Um, to begin with, I'm not really giving you like the answers that we think you should all be doing. It's more of like, let's just talk about this together. Um, and I also think it's not a place where like, we are trying to convince each other that our perspective is right on like, we're totally screwed, like, you know, we just need to like go into a hole and, and say goodbye, or like be like, no, 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 you're wrong, like there is hope, and like you're, you're being nihilistic to say that. So in order to sort of like, you know, 
like allow for those differences of experiences, opinions, um, just some group agreements is that makes this a lot easier is if we speak from personal experience, speak from the eye, just be present when you're listening to each other and respect each other. Um, and then if you're sharing like personal stories, um, keep those stories confidential unless you like want to ask somebody if you can share that out outside of the space. So. Has anybody seen this chart before? Some heads nodding, some heads not, yeah. It's like a visual color representation of the hockey stick graph in many ways of, and this is the annual temperature um, of the globe from 1850 to 2019 from the University of Reading. And um, yes, that's right. Um, and there are many different ways to represent um, sort of the predicament we're in. Um, and this is sort of the, the colors really work for me as something that um, is like we are in that deep, deep red right now. And that's something that we have to recognize is sort of where we're at. Um, and it's our reality. And um, but given that we're up against systems um, that have been constructed hundreds of years ago in many instances or, or decades ago. Right. And so we're kind of like living in this like past um, while dealing with this present and trying to figure out what we're doing with our future. Now, granted that, um, we also need to acknowledge the fact that uh, climate change and the impacts of the climate crisis and exacerbated weather events affect us differently, too. And I think that's a really important part um, of this thing that we need to talk about. And um, like myself, as like, a, you know, like a, a white man with some economic privilege and things like that, like I will be able to be like insulated from the effects of climate change. And if I wanted to, I could try to insulate myself and my like future generations for some decades to come. Um, it's my firm belief that um, no matter how hard I could try to do that, that like eventually that's not really going to work, <laughs> that these systems are um, coming at us with a force that we need to really like address as a collective. And I think that's really important. Um, but just naming that this is part of this conversation. And, um, you know, 350 Vermont is a network that tries to come together and, and talk about what to do about that in Vermont. And um, I think it's an important part of this is that it's kind of like we try to do this from the ground up, even though we're facing systems um, that are often top down. And we have distributed geographic teams of volunteers who work um, all over the state. And we also pool our collective efforts um, to, to take on state level policy that really requires like dozens and hundreds of people to be acting at the same time to get something done. Um, we'll talk about this more in the second half of the presentation, um, but just wanted to sort of tease that in some ways our very basic theory of change, what we want to do about this problem, is to change the balance of power um, from something like this, where a lot of us are concerned about the same thing, but we're not like networking together and like working together, um, using our different skills and all of that. And we want to move it to something like this, where we really like have the people power and the relationships um, and the structure to be able to affect change um, positively for all of us. And in, in kind of like one sentence, it's really like the more organized we are, the heavier we push the scale. And um, 350 Vermont's mission is really to try to like do that here as much as possible. And this is what we do in Vermont. Here are some pictures of um, <coughs> an action that we had last Saturday, or this Saturday, like four days ago, at um, fossil fuel energy plants all over Vermont. Those are the, the top two pictures. Um, and we also come together as, as communities. This is a small community conversation that I facilitated in Brandon last weekend, um, which is like south central Vermont. And um, I just needed to include the adorable picture of a kid <laughs> um, testifying to a legislator, because I think that, that's a pretty cool picture. And we're doing this um, embedded in a historical and strategic framework um, and understanding that we think that like we're, we're acting um, in kind of on the top of the shoulders of like all of these social movements that have made really drastic changes that weren't thought possible to um, 
have happened before. So this is that sort of like equation of like, we believe that this stuff is possible because we're looking at what has been possible um, and has been achieved in the past. So um, given that little introduction, um, I want us to break out into groups of four. Um, and before you do that, I'll just talk just for a second about what we're going to do. Um, and we're going to talk just a little bit about like confronting the climate crisis, what that means to us, what that brings up for us, um, and just kind of like sharing a little bit. Um, this is very much a part where we can just be in the present. We don't have to think super solutions oriented um, yet. That's something that we can like start leaning towards uh, by the second half of the, of the presentation. Um, but it's just a space where we can really talk about some things that we don't normally get prompted to talk about all the time and um, see what comes up for you. So, yes? Many of us want to know what 450 Vermont means. Uh, yes, 350. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so, so 350 Vermont. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, I mean, also to bring back to that, um, the bar graph with the colors, like, yeah. Um, it's three, 350 was a scientific number, 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was sort of like the benchmark number back in like, I think like 2000 to 2010, that was the number that everybody used as like, we need to stay underneath this threshold in order um, for us to have like a safe and habitable planet for ourselves and our future generations. Um, does anybody know what number we're at right now? Yeah, we're, we're at 420, a little bit over 420. Um, so just to give you a sense of like how f quickly we've shot past that number and um, how much we need to sort of like bring that curve down. So, um, some of you all may have heard of the 1.5 degrees Celsius number that, that came out of the 2018 IPCC, which is like a big international gathering of scientists. Um, so 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide sort of like correlates to 1.5 degrees Celsius a little bit. If that, no. Yeah, sure. So um, I printed out some worksheets with the questions so you don't have to like be like, what are we talking about again? Um, and generally just take the conversation where it leads you. Um, I think it's okay to like pursue some paths. You don't need to stick to the prompts necessarily. Um, and in order to like spend some time on this, um, we're going to go for about 15 or 20 minutes together. Um, I'll do a quick round and check in with how you're doing if, you, if you're like done or if you need more space for this. So, does that sound okay? All right. All right, great. Well. And like definitely move your chairs around too. You'll probably need it. No. Thanks. Are they the same? They are all the same, yeah. yeah. Here you two go. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, Got it? I think I, 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 I agree. Sorry, Andrea. Thank you. Yeah. There you go. I think there's an extra one in there for you. I think I printed out enough. And in just a minute, so wrap up whatever you're saying. All right, folks, let's bring it in. We're going to um, move on to the next part of this conversation. Awesome. So we'd love to hear uh, 
quickly, like, try, let's try to keep this section within like five minutes, but I would love to hear from one person from each group what kind of stood out to you. Was there any conversation strand or specific thing that was said that you all feel like the whole group should, uh, would also like to know? You can, you can t come and take the mic or you can just shout it out too, but be loud. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So building community is a, a strong theme that emerged out of the conversation. What else came up for folks? <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. I don't know if this is shared. I think it's shared. Anyway, um, the notion that people who are now retired or are in a position to give a lot of time hmm. need to step up and um, take some make some more effort because they're available and they have that time. Hmm. And the younger families who are struggling with kids and paying the rent, etc., don't really necessarily have the ability to, uh, to make it happen. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, did everybody hear that OK? I just don't want to repeat it if I don't have to. <laughs> OK. If you can't, just give, raise a hand, and I'll make sure that you get it. Oh. Um, no, that's a really great point. And like, just want to emphasize this this part of the climate crisis and, and climate change that is really hard to deal with is that like there are feelings of guilt and responsibility that permeate like almost, it can feel like it permeates almost every single decision that we, that we do, right? Like what are we buying at the grocery store? What are we eating for dinner? Like how committed am I as an activist or not? Those are things that can become really overwhelming um, if you're thinking about it constantly. Um, and sort of like putting yourself through the, the judgment ringer, you know what I mean? Um, but it's also like a super fair thing to, to think about. So, yeah. All right, what else came up for folks? You wanna? Well, I was just in reference to what you were saying about people that are more in the retirement stage, which I'm not even more. <laughs> Numer numerically, I would be, but. Yeah. Um, the, the organization Third Act, which has been developed by the, the person who, who started 350.org, uh, Bill McKibben the Third Act, is for you know senior citizens to, to uh, dig into this because of their experience and the fact that they have more time availability and maybe more financial Great. resources. Yeah, so just a little shout out to Third Act as an organization, which is active in around in Vermont. So. All right. Hey. All right, Third Act is an organization for folks in, in their third act of life, kind of in the retirement edge, and they're building a community of advocates and activists to work on uh, saving our democracy and uh, trying to mitigate the climate crisis. So, as, yeah. Um, any other major thoughts that can come from anybody in the crowd? Um, or did I skip a group? I think I, I don't know, <laughs> forgetting. But. Uh, yeah, Bob. We, we talked a little bit about the impact on health, both mental and physical, that the stress of climate change brings out. And it, it's really hard for me personally to, to try to imagine what could I do more or what did I do? Did it make any difference? That kind of thing. Hmm. And I, I lost a friend fellow activist a month and a half ago who took her own life. And she was mm. just at the point of frustration that she couldn't imagine what more can you do to get the point across to people. And the people in power don't seem to give a shit. Mm. You know, that they can't come off their golden thrones or they get out of their golden SUV and think about the people because I think they somehow think that their money will save their corporate thoughts someday when it, the rest of the world goes down. Hmm. It's not going to happen. And hmm. The sooner they become partners, you know, without having to have we the people 
be in the streets in a revolution, that may be what it's going to have to take. Hmm. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, so all of these like emotions and experiences are really real. Um, and um, at this point, I'm going to transition us from kind of talking in that realm of things to moving in towards like what is a strategy or strategies that we can think of as people um, to embrace at this moment of time. Um, and what exactly are our theories of change that we can um, think about, have in our perspectives as we continue to like move forward into the world um, and um, act on together. So, again, I just want to emphasize uh, that just as it's bad to plant a monocropped field of like one type of corn and, and um, harvest that, um, we actually need many, many types of social change and theories of change and strategies. And so in a, in a way, like diversity of perspective and opinion is very much celebrated, at least from the organizing field and school where I come from. Um, and yeah, that's all I had to say about that anyways. <laughs> um, so very, very simply, a theory of change is thinking about like if we do A, then B will happen because C. Now, there's a lot baked into all of that stuff. And like people argue for hours and hours and hours and write books about each A, B, and C, right? Um, and I think C, because of the explanation or context, is the most like contested um, part of this because like we have historical narratives and popular framings about how change happens um, that are sometimes like written by the, the victors. You know, that, that saying that like history is written by the victors, right? And so in order to try to think about like a theories of change that are a little bit more grounded in like what actually happens, you have to do some like thinking about that and debating and, and all that. So all of this to say it's a very imperfect science, um, but something that I think of is really fascinating and um, something that is worth really thinking about, too. Um, I, I mentioned briefly the, the diversity, planting a, a diverse field of crops in the same way that you want to plant a diverse field of, of change making. Um, and so 350 Vermont often uses this, this term called a movement ecosystem. And that's the idea that in order for the radical social and economic change that we need to have happen, um, we actually need like people operating in the fields that they really like excel at and work best at, um, and you know from like people front doing the frontline response and the care work and things like that to people doing like more like resistance and like getting out there on the streets to the people who are crunching the numbers and creating policies. So all of that's really really important. And there are also like a lot of people who have thought about this already. Um, and this is just a, a framing from this organization called Spirit in Action. Um, they have, I, I think they draw from like indigenous and some BIPOC folks back, this was like 15 years ago. Um, and they kind of crunched that diverse movement eco ecosystem into four different like buckets or categories. Um, and that's like reform, which is working within the current system to make them things as much better as they could be. Um, resist, working on the current system, or sort of either, however you want to put it, like tearing it down or whatever. Um, recreating, building the systems that we need to see. I think the local food movement in Vermont is a really good example of that. And reimagination, conceptualizing new systems, um, being able to like really like imagine and bring ourselves into new, new states of relating with each other. So, so this is all just like kind of background framing for a conversation. We're going to go back into breakouts again and talk a little bit about theories of change, what your own opinions are about this sort of thing. So we can cross pollinate as a group. So uh, there's a lot of different theories of change um, and I guess maybe it would make sense to like ask you all to like call some out. So like, 
are we feeling comfortable or familiar enough with this idea? If I was like, could you throw out some ideas or like how change happens? Would you be able to, to say something? What are some thoughts? Yeah. There seems to be a tipping point at some point, right? I don't know if it comes from organizing, like you talked about. Mm. Yeah, tipping point. So this moment where like things kind of like accelerate. That also gets to a really interesting theories of change about like the the historical moments that you're that you're working in, or the um, I'm trying to remember what they called it, like the movement moment or historical conjuncture of where we're at, and this idea that sometimes change can be really rigid and, and loose, and then there are other moments where it goes really fast. So, yeah. Sure, yeah, so elements of really like strong, intense emotions. Um, violence is an agent of change. Like, that's a fact that we, that we have to think about as the climate crisis worsens. Um, and also, like, we, 350 Vermont comes from a deep history and belief in nonviolence and nonviolent direct action as also an agent of change and a, and a theory of change that. If, say, like we place our bodies in specific like junctures of a broken system, um, then that is able to illuminate the failings of that system to the wider public, and then that triggers change in policy and social communities. So like that's an example of the if A happens to make B happen, then, then because C. No. Uh, yeah, go ahead. This is kind of a weird idea I just thought of, but it seems like Sometimes you need like leaders who have strong uh, leadership uh, persuasive capabilities. Like I'm thinking of Martin Luther King Jr. Mm. at the time of the Civil Rights Movement and people who gathered with him. Um, I personally, because of my lack of my ignorance, I'm not as familiar. Is there a person or persons that are, I hear this name Bill McKibben mentioned, but sure. we need, I feel like one theory of change is to have somebody who's really going to rouse up the group and get, make it happen, so to speak. Yeah, so um, great, great topic. I mean, you just jumped into a raging debate in the theory of social change about like the role of the grassroots and the people who direct change from the ground up versus the role of like charismatic individuals or single people who uh, direct change from, from the top down. Right. Um, and, you know, uh, like, Charismatic people like Martin Luther King Jr. like obviously have a huge role to play in in history, um, and I, I put big man of history very much up top here, um, and I'm just so these are some popular examples. They're not examples that I actually necessarily even endorse as um, things that like we should strive for or things like that. A good example is individual consumption or habit changes. Um, I think that like. That's an important thing in some ways, but also like we actually need to change an entire system. And if I was writing out my own personal theory of change and it started and ended with I can only like do the things by myself and like only buy the things by myself and that's the only way I'll make change, then I think that like that's a bit limited and we, we can think about other ways of changing as well. So, um, so as you're looking this Looking at this list, is anything else coming up in terms of like theories of change? Do you have questions about anything that, that is up here? I'm seeing Andrea and then, yeah. Um, I think one of the things I've been thinking about is, uh, I think and some of this has to do with what was earlier said about, you know, it takes a crisis, it takes a disaster or something like that. But I think consequences cause change. Mm -hmm. and there are consequences that people find unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think of the most recent examples that came to my mind is one, this is a very tiny one, but it kind of illustrates it. We had Hurricane Katrina, and in the aftermath of that, when they were trying to rescue people, um, the, the prevailing you know, way of doing things, policy was no pets. 
We're yeah. not going to take your pet. We're only going to take you. And many, many people refused to go with the rescue boats, refused to be rescued because they couldn't take their pets. Well, lo and behold, after Katrina, the Red Cross, giant organization, changed its policy. Mm. And now, when there's a crisis and a disaster, their dictum to their people who are working is pets are included and pets are taken into account and taken care of. And the other example that, that comes to my mind is really um, the Black Lives Matter movement and the murders that took place. Mm -hmm. And yes, there were many of them. And it, again, tipping point, but enough people found that set of circumstances so unacceptable that they were willing to go out in the streets, they were willing to break the law, they were willing to do things they hadn't previously been willing to do. Mm. And I, I'm hoping, I'm really hoping, that we're going to get to that point where people are willing to step outside what's their normal mm. response to a higher level of response um, than, than they're com you know, maybe previously comfortable with. Mm. Because the consequences are just so unacceptable. You know, yeah. People dying from heat, you know, what was I saw today? Seventy-four thousand people died in Europe so far this year from heat. Wow! Wow! That's a lot of people. Yeah. And most of them were elderly, and most of them were poor. Mm. I, I just heard from a friend of mine who's a school teacher in New Orleans that they're closing the schools because it's so hot. A lot of the schools don't have air conditioning, air conditioning so kids are. It's a whole issue about like, are you going to get the education that you're supposed to get because of the climate? And yeah. It's being too hot to go to school. Yeah. So I think we've like warmed up enough where I think it would be good to cross pollinate again and, and be able to really like everybody talk about this a little more. And so um, we're going to go into our second breakout. Um, feel free to mix them up if you want, but stay in the same group if you want to. That's OK. Um, and essentially, like I, the question is to think about moments in the past that you're aware of that that changes happens. And just ask yourself, like, why do you think that happens? Like, what do you think was going on there in the background? And it's okay, like, to, if you don't know a whole lot about this, like, part of the reason why we're having this workshop is to flex the, the muscles of thinking about it and, like, exercising those critical thinking skills. Because once you bring that into how you're observing power dynamics in your day-to-day -day life, like how you're observing social change happen in Vermont and in your communities, it will make you a, a a more, honestly, a more powerful person and a more powerful like member of your community if you're thinking about it. So, so that's sort of the, the point of this. Um, anyways, you have your, um, yeah, your worksheets are, are right there. So let's break out. And this will just be, I think, 10 minutes, more or less. And then um, I'll talk to you just for a small, short amount of time about what 350 Vermont's theory of change is, like how, how we try to do things. And then we'll wrap from there. Thanks. Okay, folks, let's bring it in. I know we, I'm sure we could keep talking, um, but the pizza's coming soon, and I want to say a couple things before your attention gets quite distracted. But <laughs> um, <laughs> quickly, before I just say a couple things, any any major thoughts or questions that arose from your conversations? It's okay if not to. We can we can keep it coming. Yeah, uh, like this one. So this is something I guess I just asked, but that individual. Where was it? Removing consent of the governed. Oh yeah, that's a wonky phrase. Sorry. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
No, that's a really good question. And like that gets really complicated when um, the system or the thing that we're in like gets us addicted or reliant on these things. We're like to remove our consent of fossil fuels and just stop using them immediately would actually be a dangerous thing to do for, for folks in Vermont in the winter, for example, if they, if they haven't, aren't getting their heat pump set up. Um, but uh, I put that in because that is a very powerful um, strategy or, or tactic of social movements, um, especially in labor. Um, and like when you're, you're studying um, like how to topple a dictator, for example, like, like nonviolent revolutions and things like that, um, consent of the government governed and specific pillars of power like the press and the army um, and like industry and things like that. Um, that gets tied into that, I suppose. Oh. Um, any other thoughts? Yeah. We were talking a lot about the difficulty of our modern world because of the influence of corporate power. And that yeah. corporations are just in everything. Mm. And, and they're so embedded in every single aspect of life. And they wield so much power by virtue of that and by virtue of their money and their ability to influence every other sector that that it, it, it's, it's, you know, it's like the worst octopus you could possibly imagine <laughs> as far as you try and work on one thing here, but you could find it's connected to everything else over there. Mm. And it's all part of the same thing. That yeah. We've created a system that almost guarantees that even removing consent of the governed mm. isn't sufficient because it's not about it's not even about the government anymore. It's about the corporations. Huh. Yeah, for sure. So uh, Andrea was talking just about just how prevalent money money is and um, corporate corporatism, corporate capitalism in the United States. Um, even in Vermont, that's something that we discovered. Um, it's global. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and like you know, 350 Vermont has been pushing at, at the legislature in the state house and for. For like three years, we were like building a pretty relatively powerful statewide network. And what we're realizing is that it's it's actually like the influence of our utility companies behind the scenes as the bills are getting written and the lobbyists that they're able to hire that is like way more problematic than um, the the senators or representatives who need to be convinced. So, totally. Um, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. That cartoon you have. Mm. If all but two or three walk off the platform, then those two or three remaining will go down with the guy on the podium. <laughs> so what has to happen is they have to all go off at once <clears throat> for that to work. Mm. And in a way, that kind of symbolizes what we have to do in a lot of other situations. A few people walking away from their support, a certain percentage of the population not supporting a particular Mm. You've got to take away enough support to have the impact you need to finish the job. Sure, great. Yeah, thanks for that observation. Um, okay, so um, I just wanted to bring out a couple of things. So, like, I've been organizing with 350 Vermont for two years professionally. Um, I've been a student organizer since I was like 17 in high school. and. Um, so I've, I've gone through a lot of iterations of my own theories of change and like observing other people um, and, and going to school about like learning how to organize and stuff. And these are a couple things that have popped up as that I would consider false friends when we're thinking about theories of change. And that's not to say that these don't have an impact, but that's to say that these, I think, when, when considered as like the primary impact that we can have, um, can sometimes bog down social movements. Um, so one of the things um, I'll start with, well, I'm going out of order here, but education without action. So a lot of times I'll pull together a group of people that are really worried about a problem. And you know, the first thing they say, understandably, is like, we just seem to like, tell people about this. If everybody knew about the problem, then it would be better. Um, and I think what we're seeing more and more is that like, people are well aware of the problem that we have right now in Vermont in many ways, um, well aware of the solutions, but we're up against 
like a seriously rigged system when we're talking about the corporations who are blocking things and stuff like that. So um, education is excellent when paired with action that can disrupt uh, a system and create new ones. Um, um, just generally individualism um, and like the, the idea of individual actions as being um, the most important thing you can do. Um, it, it's 350 Vermont's strong belief that collective action is like um, exponentially more impactful than individual action. Um, that's not to say like I don't really consider what I'm eating and consuming on my day-to-day -day basis. Um, but um, I truly think like I have witnessed as a student say like a group of 15 people um, with the passive support of an entire campus move like Middlebury's billion dollar divestment um, um, off of fossil fuels and things like that. And so um, collective action can really have a big impact. Um, and then also like the techn technology will save us silver bullet thing. Like we do need to be developing um, much better and cleaner technologies, um, but it's also like embedded in a cultural and economic system that we also need to be um, rethinking, reimagining, reinventing. So. Okay, so as I re uh, said earlier, 350 Vermont's very basic theory of change is, is changing the balance of power from this to this, where we're networking together, um, getting out of that in individualistic mindset and like moving together with collective power. Um, a couple very important framings that I think um, are, are valuable for you all to take away about how 350 Vermont organizes. I mean, obviously we got the fish thing. That's just like the more we are, the more powerful we are. I love that. Um, there's also this concept of the Overton window. Has anybody ever heard of that before or would like to take a stab at explaining it? That's okay, that's what I'm standing up here for. So, <laughs> so the Overton window is just sort of like the realm of what's politically or socially acceptable at a given moment. And um, there is a role to play for activists in a society um, to pull the Overton window one way or another. So I would say that like Trump and the Christian alt-right movement has very successfully pulled the Overton window um, more towards their agenda, where um, like somebody who was considered like a, a center-right figure like you know, back when Obama was running for president is looking very different in their policies and what's politically possible than somebody who's like ostensibly center. I don't even know what's going on with them, but whatever. <laughs> um, but the idea is that like, this is an interesting one, especially for the people who kind of like working like on the system or outside of the system is that there's like all of these folks in a bureaucracy and they're plugging and like working on what's, what's feasible, what's politically possible. But if you shift that window for them, you're suddenly like bringing along all that manpower and that expertise. And I think I, we saw that pretty effectively, say with the, uh, the Sunrise Movement, that group of young college and high school kids who were really pressuring like the Biden administration on a Green New Deal. And so suddenly there are all of these like career bureaucrats who are putting out like pretty good policy on climate um, and they wouldn't have otherwise done that if the Overton window had not shifted. So um, happy to talk more about that. It's a little bit of like a, a wonky organizer term, um, but just the idea that like it's within our power to change what's socially acceptable um, is, is something that's pretty powerful. So Connor, are you saying that the Overton window would move from that middle part, sensible part, to, 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 to shift it either to the up or down? Yeah, and like I think, um, the words that you see on the right are like not necessarily value statements for what we believe in. So like it's unthinkable right now to have an economy that doesn't rely on fossil fuels, right? But if we shift the Overton window, then like it becomes unthinkable to radical. So like I would say it is a radical thought right now, but it's not unthinkable. Um, and we're working to like move that into the sensible, the popular. Um, and then finally getting baked into policy. So. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. Should we be, based on what you just described, what happened to you guys in the, in the um, state house, I guess it is, um, should we be devoting more of our energy towards corporations rather than mm. the politicians who get sucked into the corporate power system? 
Hey, it's a great question. It's something that we're like, we're trying to figure out right now ourselves. Yeah, we, we don't really know. Um, and it's also like we don't, we're trying to figure out what it looks like to, to pressure companies and corporations. Like utilities are a monopoly. Right. Um, and so it's not like you can like go and support their competitors because it's like, there's none of that, you know? Yeah. Um, Right. I mean, one thing we're definitely thinking about, and it's sort of related to the Overton window, is like Vermont's utilities are generally considered like leading in the country, um, extremely like 100% renewable portfolio and things like that. Um, there are many ways in which these companies are negotiating in good faith, and there are other ways in which they are spinning a really good PR strategy and greenwashing, um, which is a, a term for kind of like hiding some of the more polluting energy that they have. Um, so that's something that we're, we're hopefully going to be working on in the fall. So, um, yeah. I'm curious about what you, how you evaluated the uh, demonstration that you all did on the weekend. Oh, on Saturday. Whether you felt that that had, had any consequences. <laughs> Great question. I mean, it can be really hard to tell um, when rallies or demonstrations have consequences. Um, but I think that's a good example of the Overton window. So there are these things called peaker plants, plants that run when energy demand is really high, um, not a lot of people knew about them, and our utilities take 10 to 15 percent of our utility bill, um, gets put into an auction and kind of like funneled into these plants um, that aren't like financially sustainable. Um, and so companies like BED are keeping around these age-old dinosaur fossil fuel plants basically as like cash cows for their for their budget. Um, and I think we were we are trying to get the word out there that these things exist and that um, your friendly local utility is like keeping a, a jet fuel engine in your backyard. Um, and I think to that degree, hopefully was, was successful. So we'll see. But, okay, looks like our pizza's here. So I'm just gonna go through basically two more important parts about 350 Vermont's theory of change and then we'll be wrapping up for the evening. So, so I think um, this is something where um, n not all quality of participation in a social movement is the same, if that makes sense. And so really in 350 Vermont, we, we think of um, transformative organizing instead of transactional organizing. So like, it's great if you show up to a march and rally and go home, but what we're really looking for is training folks to be able to like take leadership into their own hands and do that deeper organizing where you're really thinking about what can I do in my community, who am I talking to to make that change happen? Like that is a qualitatively different type of advocate and activist than um, somebody who like goes to a rally and then goes home, if that makes sense. Not to say that's not what you should do, but <laughs> um, 350 Vermont's theory of change is like, you know, trying to build up a, a compassionate network of leaders, really, not just folks who are like sending in buttons on petitions. Um, finally, there's this idea of scales of change, and I think um, we, we could have a whole other workshop on this, but essentially, like, there's a way that you can scale your, your activism from the, from the ground up um, in a way that makes, makes it appreciative change. Um, we build nodes to take local action in our community, um, and I said this earlier, then we, like, come together to push for state policy. Um, at the same time, we're part of a national movement. There are 350, Vermont, or 350 state groups kind of like all over the country, and we're coming together to kind of like push together. So I guess that's sort of like a, a theory of change that you also have to have trust in your, in your friends and allies and in the movement all around, um, and that from 350 Vermont's perspective, we are able to get the most done and make the most impact on a local and state level. So. All right. And that's pretty much it. Um, the more organized we are, the heavier we push the scale. And so that is very much um, what I hope you all will take away from this and hope that you feel um, moderately inspired to, to get more involved in one way or another or to keep at least keep these questions in the back of your mind um, or actively interrogate like what you think the best way to make changes and find some way to incorporate that into your daily practice. So. Um, we have a sign-up sheet over here. Um, if you just put your email down, you'll get the follow-up email with some resources, the slideshows, things like that. If you check the box, say, I want to get involved, then we'll, then we'll like, reach out to you and say, like, hey, you want to come to our next meeting, things like that. Um, 
Our Montpelier node is a, a, a small and mighty and strong crew of people um, who have put on this educational event series for you. Um, and uh, we're probably going to try to have Roger Hill back in the fall. Um, he emailed us and said potentially October if he's feeling better. So definitely keep an eye out for that. That would be really exciting. And our next workshop in September is um, really delving into the like, what are we going to do about it? The, work, the workshop's called Where the Rubber Meets the Road, essentially. So we've been thinking and talking a lot this summer about potential things to do. And that's going to be a space where we're like, all right, we have like three or four concrete projects. Let's talk about the pros and cons of each one. Like if anybody has ideas on how to get started and then like actually start doing the thing. So, um, and obviously if that sounds appealing to you but you can't make that September workshop, um, just reach out to the node members and we'll be sure to like loop you into the actual organizing that is gonna be happening. So. Uh, it is the last Wednesday of September, which I think is September 23rd. Um, if anybody has like a calendar out. But. I'll also just plug like even if you don't feel like you have the time for that or something, there are many other ways of bringing your people power in. So something 350 Vermont does every year is we organize constituents to meet with their, uh, their representatives and their senators um, and basically be like, all right, like we give a shit about climate change. Like what's your, what are your thoughts about this session? Um, Often it becomes kind of a relationship because all of our reps and senators are, are essentially volunteers who have like crazy little time to do this stuff. And so um, we start by just sitting down as, as a group of constituents and in different pockets of the state, we now have folks reaching out to us and being like, I don't understand this bill, like can you help me interpret it or things like that. So if you wanna do something like that to your, with your rep or senator in, in Washington County or wherever you are, that's another like thing to keep tab keep tabs on. I think it's a really great thing that 350 Vermont does too. So. Did you say the third Wednesday? September 25th. September 25th. The. Is it the last one? The last. The last. The, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so September 25th, yep. 6 to 8 p.m. right here. I'll bet you we'll have pizza again too. So. <laughs> Start running. Yeah. Sometimes you guys decided that pizza is the major. All right, thank you everybody so much. Really appreciate your time, yeah.